Okay, hello. Uh, let's start with my talk. Uh, about um, never booted OpenBC workstations. Um, uh, first, uh, who am I? Um, I'm a software developer in profession, uh, so Martha, degree in engineering, and uh, I'm uh, building around what we see uh, since um, 3.9 and uh, contributing a little bit since um, Polar Oak. And uh, since 6.6, .6, uh, I'm officially developing there. And um, uh, I'm talking about um, these network booted um, OpenC workstation project um, I made uh, at our company. Um, in our company, we have um, a little um, called job swatch, uh, job uh, swap program where you can swap your uh, um, your workplace with another one in, in the company, so you can see how other departments are working and uh, have some kind of experience in the exchange. Um, and they are making a swap to our internal IT department, and we came to the idea, hey, let's look uh, how hard can it be to run OpenSD on our uh, workstations. Uh, so let's have a look at um, what the given environment was when I started. Um, um, we are the, the good old-fashioned Unix cell uh, company, which was founded uh, in the beginning of the 90s. And since then, we first used um, BSD OS workstations, and then we switched to Linux uh, in the start of the 2000s. Um, and, um, so the game environment was um, already into the um, Unix kind of environment. And then I'm looking around uh, with um, an internal administrator. So let's try to do this project. I had uh, two weeks uh, officially uh, for that. And in our game environment, we have um, these Linux workstations. Um, all our homes are um, on NFS mounted central place. Uh, all Linux workstations are centrally managed by the IT department. So here's the user. Um, doesn't depend if you're a developer or if you're just from the sales department or somewhere else. You're not gonna manage your own workstation. It's simply managed uh, for the um, security reasons. Um, uh, uh, we have a central uh, Adobe server for central authentication, which is used uh, uh, mainly for uh, for services, uh, but um, also for uh, the workstation itself to log in. Um, and the administrators have a little system um, to easily maintain all these workstations. There's around um, 250 uh, over the whole company. And what they do is the workstations automatically boot um, a group bootloader uh, over PXC. And the default is it boots uh, from the local disk. But optionally, you can um, run the installer. So um, they, that's the method they use to um, deploy new machines. They just uh, have uh, a general new machine. Um, put their MAC address of the machine into the central system and place it somewhere in the company when the machine boots up and, um, and they uh, select um, the, uh, the optional install and automatically installs itself. So the idea was um, installing this on this workstation would be quite hard because um, you messed up um, the system which are already running. Maybe there's some loss of data. Uh, even if the home are at the home, there's some separate partition for um, bulk data on the workstation itself. Um, but it's um, kind of frickling um, to install it actually on the workstation. So the idea was um, try to make um, a diskless boot. So the system is, is a live system and it comes over the network and then place a new, a new option in the um, boot, boot um, loader, optional um, BSD live boot. This was the idea. So what do we need for this? Um, this is indeed an environment we need. So here you see um, what, is, what happens on the client side when we boot up. And what do we need on the, on the server side to uh, bring, this, bring us uh, to this uh, condition where we have an actually running OpenSea user end? And I will show uh, you um, in the next slide um, how this uh, works. Uh, what happens and how do you configure this stuff? And it seems uh, to be pretty easy. Um, 
it costs me um, a day to keep this uh, running so that I can simply boot um, uh, multi-user userland, and the rest uh, I'm just um, um, polishing up uh, the, the stuff. But uh, to keep this running, it's costs you just a day or, or a few hours if you're uh, a bit familiar with the uh, OpenBC. Um, um, I show this uh, from a perspective of a normal workstation and not from this kind that we are using with uh, this group uh, bootloader. Uh, normally the BIOS um, pays up and it boots um, over network, so it makes a DHCP request and you easily have to um, uh, configure a DHCP. Um, I think um, uh, most of you will, uh, will have done that if you um, um, have an administrator background or uh, working around with Unix systems at all. It's not that uh, hard, just um, throw the MAC address into it, um, define some IP address, and give them the next boot uh, file, which uh, or the, uh, the file name of the bootloader. And they just take um, the bootloader, which, uh, which is on the um, FTP servers, or, or at the mirrors, and the PXC bootloader is a special um, um, special build of boot, which knows have to um, boot further over over network. So what happens is um, um, it fetches uh, when it comes up. It uh, the BIOS fetches these um, um, these files directly from um, the next server, which is on the same machine. So you have to configure TFTPD. TFTPD is um, easily uh, configured. Yeah, um, you're creating a directory. Uh, copy um, the TC bootloader, which is already on your system. If um, you assume that the software system is also an OpenBC um, in the directory, uh, and then um, just um, configure um, the flags of the daemon and start the daemon. So it's not that um, it's not that hard. Hard and um, so the uh, BIOS is able to fetch this file. After it fetches this file, it um, starts this one the bootloader. The bootloader then um, um, knows um, which IP address it has from the BIOS and where the next server is, and it wants to grab um, a BSD kernel um, to boot on. And it also uses um, 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 TFTP for it, and you just have to copy um, your kernel uh, into this directory, and it can fetch this kernel. So now we are in kernel, and the kernel knows, OK, I was booted over network. The bootloader um, says the kernel, you, are, um, you um, have been booted or from this MAC address. So the kernel knows, okay, I have this MAC address on this interface and I was booted um, from there. Now, where's my username? I don't know. I just think a kernel hanging around on one machine without um, any disk. And it came from network. What the kernel does is first is ask himself, where is the IP address um, uh, or what IP address do I have? Um, you could use uh, DHCP for this, and it would be sensible. But in the OpenBC kernel, there is no implementation for a DHCP. So in general, we use the DHCP client in, in userland to figure out what our peer address is. But in this case, uh, it uses reverse ARP. And um, because we, all, um, we already have an ARP infrastructure in the kernel to resolve ARP, and uh, to make result, um, um, re the recursive problem, yeah, reverse ARP, it's um, it's uh, quite easier than to implement the whole TTHP client into the kernel. That's the reason um, why at this stage uh, it uses um, this protocol. Um, on the other side, on, on the server, you have to um, run these ARC um, reverse daemon, or RP, and um, the, the configuration is easy, quite simple. You have um, EC inserts and EC hosts. Uh, who of you heard of um, ethers in before? Ah, oh, a few of you. And who of you knows uh, ethers hosts? Yeah, all of us. Yeah, yeah ethers um, isn't used that much, um, maybe from this um, from this uh, demon. And there are one or two other user and tools who use this to show us to show up uh, names for MAC addresses, as um, the same as. Um, um, the host uh, file is there for showing up a uh, host name for IP addresses. And uh, this daemon used both files. Uh, um, if a reverse ARP request comes in, 
and looks up um, the mega risk and has the, the host name for it, and then looks up the host name to get uh, the IP address and sends back the answer to the, to the server, uh, to the kernel. So now our kernel knows, ah, okay, this is my mega risk, this is my IP address. Um, uh, let's, um, uh, let's go forward. Um, if you set up these and try to do it in a little setup uh, like I do for, uh, for research before for my project, I just um, do this. I have uh, one client, one server directly connected them with one cable, so it's easy, and just try to make these little um, uh, network boots there. Let me figure out, hmm, it doesn't work. The kernel always panics here, always panics here because it never gets back um, the reverse up request. But why does it happen? And it, and it debugged it and um, made some printf to the kernel, and I don't know why. It's, and it's always um, I suck up in the uh, in, in DDD because it never could find out its appearance. Then I figured out, okay, the reason is um, when when the uh, boot loader starts the kernel, and the kernel attaches all devices, it attaches the um, Ethernet device. And by attaching it and in initializing the Ethernet device, the link goes down and goes up and goes down again. And um, this is the reason why um, the link on the other side also goes up and down. And then um, this um, daemon isn't served anymore by the, by the kernel. And so it misses the package when the other kernel asks about um, where is my IP address. So if you, if you try to set up, don't do this. It won't, um, if you get in this, in, in this trouble and it costs you a lot of data to debug this. Just use switch. <laughs> and so the link is stable and you can just um, do this um, 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 straightforward and you have no problems. But this is, um, it costs you days to figure this out. If you, if you don't get aware of it, this, this could be a problem. Just uh, a hint of mind to serve, to serve you some time. So now we just take the address. Uh, now we need our Ethernet. But where is our Ethernet? Um, some web systems defined uh, uh, a protocol for this uh, called boot power, and we have a boot power B who serves this. What the kernel does, it asks over the, uh, this um, protocol uh, in the network, uh, where are my boot power meters? So, and the server on the other side, the boot power B, uh, knows for our client. Uh, where the root uh, file system is. Root file system is over N NFS in these um, uh, in these paths on, on our server. And this is all you have to do to configure the boot power view. Just add a line for the, with the host name of your client. The boot power view also knows um, hosts um, uh, the uh, the host file and uh, uh, knows um, if there come um, in requests from, from from the kernel that um, these matches to this line. And then it um, sends back the parameter of the URL system is at this NFS mount. And now our kernel knows, ah, cool, there's my root file system. So let's, uh, let, let's mount this uh, via NFS. But wait, where uh, or how do we create the root file system? Um, well, wh where do we get this from? We can't use this from the um, server itself because then we have uh, another server. Uh, we want to have um, a single workstation with how to create one. It's not that hard. Um, I um, uh, looked at the installer and just um, um, redo what the installer does. Mainly just unpack all the um, uh, set files you get from, from the mirror, uh, even with, um, uh, with the X ones, so that you have a graphical, uh, graphical interface. And unpack this into your export client. Which you exported via uh, NFS, and um, then you have to uh, then you will find some um, other uh, um, sets, the ETC and the XETC. You also have to unpack them. Uh, create uh, the uh, the devices. Just went to in, just go to this directory and um, call make that all. And so you have um, a proper root file system. Now you have to do some configuration. For the client, um, at least you need uh, to tell the user that after what, um, 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 after the kernel boots, the user has also to uh, has also need to know where to find some um, some mount points, and you tell him here where the root system is and and some other um, places he needs to know. Um, needs a mount, 
and configure some some services. On the services, uh, I came <coughs> later. Um, you need to have to configure a name uh, and that the interface uh, itself um, is configured over TFTP. And then you need to configure um, something like a port, um, port map and um, uh, YP bindings. And this is for central management so that every client uh, uh, doesn't have to be aware of or doesn't have to have its own um, pass. Um, SVD, pass WD uh, file. Uh, so we use a uh, YP uh, yellow page stuff for central management. Uh, uh, let's show up um, um, X uh, if it comes up and uh, then configure uh, this YP stuff here so um, that the local tools uh, are able to look up uh, on the central place the um, user information or the pass uh, password information. Um, when you have, um, after creating a root file system and thinking about, I want to roll this out for the whole company, for all computers, it's around 250, um, how many space do I need for this if I have a root file system for every installation or for every um, um, workstation? How big is this? Does have someone an idea of how big a, um, a default installation of OpenBC is if you unpack all the sets? Four and a half gigs. One gig. One gig, exactly. It's one gig. So I need around about 250 gigabytes of, uh, um, of space for every uh, root system uh, of all workstations. But then I um, looked at how, um, where does all this memory go to? Or what is so big about um, these? And if you um, look at the, uh, the root file system, you see hmm, it's quite, it's not that big, just Slash user. Slash user is uh, about 95% uh, of all the, the disk space you need. And the rest is just um, um, 35 megabyte. So make our calculation again, and we see if we share slash user, which is uh, just read, uh, which we just use uh, read, uh, readable for all workstations, uh, we just have a root file system for uh, around about uh, 34, 35 megabyte per workstation, for a 250 workstation, we just need 8 or 5 gigabyte. So you save a lot of um, disk space, which, um, which you had um, doubled, not even for this setup, even if you have a workstation where everything is uh, doubled. Yeah? I noticed in your previous example, you were mounting slash user from the server. Yeah. Um, do you know the issues with uh, managing to upgrade the server and getting slash user ahead of the kernel on your disk source stations before rebooting them? Pardon? Um, you get the libraries on the slash user yeah. ahead of the kernels on your diskless workstation because the server's own slash user gets upgraded when it upgrades? Um, upgrades is, is, a, is a special um, uh, um, topic which I uh, want to handle later. Yeah, okay. to, to, to um, use this in this, um, in this setup and you want to use slash user from, your, uh, from the server, then the server as well as the workstation have to be or have to run on the same uh, version of OpenBSD. So if you're trying to use this with, snap, uh, with, uh, with snapshots or so, it could be quite hard to, to make updates while the clients are running. Um, so it's easiest to have your, your polling stable. And for updates, you um, have your special byte I want to explain later. Uh, but this time, we assume we have all the same version. So, so it works. Um, uh, but now we have um, many root file systems configured as shown before. And we have not that much disk space. Um, and um, let's go uh, further with uh, our boot process. So now the kernel um, mounts uh, its root file system over an NFS. And um, for, um, to get the NFS running uh, on the server, um, you, need, you need these three demons, enabling and installing them, and then before, just um, configure the export file, which defines which directories is, your, is the server exporting uh, over NFS uh, to the local network. Um, here's our, uh, in another hint, or one obvious thing is that you have to, for uh, read-only slash user, uh, export um, slash user uh, as read-only, as well as a var db package. This is useful if you want to use um, package info on the clients. Um, I, I use this um, a lot. Uh, I'm not able to install stuff on my workstation, but 
I look at, um, I'm looking up um, um, packages uh, on my workstation. So in CR, if these and these um, packages are available, so I can ask <coughs> the administrators to install this uh, for me. And I also want to do this on uh, on, my, on the OpenSD workstation. Then see, I have to um, export with uh, with only the package database. So I can see packages are installed with version of this, and I can uh, look up. Um, um, other packages which are already it is user local contained under that user file system on, on the server. Pardon? Yeah, when you're exporting slash user from the server, yeah. read only, does that include user local? Yeah. Because you are getting the packages from the server. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Automatically um, <coughs> user local. So um, every package installed on the server is automatically available at all time. Um, and you have just a one line to export um, the client itself. Um, it's a file system. So now the, now the kernel um, has um, a root file system and starts userland. When userland comes up, it's quite normal as it would be uh, installed locally. Uh, it asks for DSP, configures interfaces, um, and then uh, for remote management, um, you have these uh, yellow page stuff. Um, the configuration um, works that way. Um, there is this older uh, yellow page um, server, which um, which works in a way that um, um, it uses the password information and uh, the login information from the from the server itself. So we have um, to configure all user accounts on, on the server. This is a possible way to to um, boot up or uh, um, initialize the system or or uh, set of this. But we have an um, LDAP server running with all this information. So what you have to do is um, uh, use a YP LDAP as a human instead of uh, YP server. And so you can uh, adapt to this um, external LDAP server. Um, I shrink this configuration a bit um, and condense it. Um, you have only to um, be aware of it or you have to see that um, Every user object or every um, user account has this um, object class policy account on it. And this policy account um, uh, in objects at the user account has the, um, all the information you need, has the, um, the user IDs, the group IDs, um, the group names, um, so that, you, uh, that this team is able to, to look up this one. Um, we have to introduce these. Um, because we don't uh, we don't use uh, LDAP um, before this project, we don't use this for log information for our Linux workstations. This was handled before in another way, and we just uh, had this uh, LDAP server for mail authentication. So if you authenticate uh, against our mail server, uh, and there they had not uh, these objects on it. After we um, add this object on it, we could use this in, in this way so that the clients could. Um, Figure out which user IDs have um, um, on which account and where is which um, password, or which or I could um, what's called um, verify passwords um, over over the other server. But when you introduce um, such objects, it's, it's be possible that other applications um, um, get in trouble. We had a mail server application which uh, don't be uh, um, expected that these um, object class. Um, would be added to the user accounts, and then um, strange stuff stuff uh, um, happens. Uh, our administrator went and able to log in as root as, uh, as our mail server, so because of um, a fucking mail server software. But um, if you um, changing stuff at the um, LDAP server, you can um, you have to be a little bit careful about this because the uh, copy software may break. This happens uh, at the, as I'm trying to do this. But um, if you get this working, then you are in a good condition. Um, to make this working, you have to um, run or you have to configure this YP bind on the client. And then um, the rest uh, works quite well. Uh, some hints. Uh, one, uh, I already have to said before uh, export our packages to. Um, uh, to have um, the package information um, on the client, so that uh, users on the client can look up the packages, and uh, use um, swap. Uh, or uh, so we haven't swap on on the on the client, so we use for slash temp uh, very fast system. Um, 
Um, this makes the workstations a bit faster than to um, uh, than to use um, slash um, tab on the NFS server. So this is um, a little hint. And um, the reason um, and the from, ex um, from the user experience point of view, um, it's not that um, slow to have you trust them on a remote machine because you have buffer cache. And um, this makes it um, quite fast, so you don't even notice that it's um, that the um, disk isn't locally on it. So you can fetch them over over network. The hardware I used um, was that uh, was the default uh, Intel workstation. This is the workstation um, I have, um, just an a normal uh, Intel Core CPU. <coughs> Was, uh, of RAM, which is um, a lot for a normal desktop OpenBC system. If you just do any virtualization stuff or special um, um, video converting stuff, or if you don't use any specialized um, software, which is a lot of RAM, you don't need it any more than a few gigabytes, and 80 gigabytes is more than enough. Um, as I did that, um, uh, that's the project last year. I just have a 100 megabit um, connection at my workstation because of the switching layer now, obviously. Uh, but so it was quite decent um, if you compare this um, uh, to to the um, local disk. So this is a bit slower, but it's not um, it's not that slow that you um, freaking out like, oh my god, is everything too slow? It's um, if it um, loads to RAM um, quite um, fast. It's okay to to use this. Um, the the server the administrators gave me um, a, a virtualized server with just four gigabyte um, RAM. It was connected with uh, one gigabit and has um, one hundred twenty eight gigabit um, uh, gigabyte um, disk. But I don't need this disk at, at all. Um, I just use um, around ten gigabyte for, for all of those. So you don't have to be aware of this. From the user experience. Um, the system starts a bit slower. I would say the kernel takes as um, the double of time, or the, um, the double amount of time than it would be locally. And if you start a program, a big one like Firefox or um, LibreOffice, it starts also. It takes double the time when it starts. But when it's there, it's, everything is loaded in um, in RAM. Uh, and you can uh, and it runs as fast as it's normal locally. So there's no no difference. Um, no local storage um, would be a problem if you um, want this, uh, or if you if you're dealing around with this with huge file data, um, could be a problem. But um, in normal um, in normal um, office um, um, office work, you don't have this problem. And the um, an interesting case was um, the rollout of all workstations. So the, the script I have the transcript to create uh, 250 works. Uh, 250 root file systems cost me just 12 minutes for uh, for all these work in for all these root file systems, and then they are able to to boot up. Um, if you try to install all these workstations at, at the same time with network install automatically uh, to um, put the Linux on it, it would be um, of course a lot longer. A default a normal installation, um, um, for example, Ubuntu or Fedora, costs um, over half an hour. So, and if you have this uh, for all workstations at the same time, um, uh, it costs a bit longer when they all um, try to fetch the stuff from, from, from the internet in, in parallel. Um, a few problems uh, I get into after the workstations came up, and some people try to, um, to use this. One problem I, I don't have on my, um, on my team was this one. I figured out a few workstations uh, have these issues. Not actually this hard, but um, from this company, and uh, so we have no um, acceleration driver for um, for NVIDIA. And then you um, you see, oh, everything is um, really slow. But this um, the same experience that you have with, uh, locally. But um, when you see your workstation have um, these cards in it, then you have to uh, get around or get them out. Maybe you have an, a normal Intel um, onboard graphic, and this um, would work quite well with OpenBSD. Uh, another problem I ran into, um, I use the same uh, home directory mounts uh, as I used with Linux, with, with Linux, and then I figured out, oh, yeah, that's a problem if you have all your dot .files shared with Linux. 
Um, the tools behave a little, a little bit different. Um, a few tools uh, I, I installed have an, another, um, uh, another version than we have on our Linux workstation. And you get in trouble um, with, with the dot files. So you have to um, copy them or, or backup them, and you have to switch in between the dot files um, when you're switching between Linux and OpenBSD. Because setup is so easy, you can just um, boot it, uh, and you are in OpenBSD, and, and see if something doesn't work well. You have to change the files, and you can uh, boot back to so Linux again just by, re by, by rebooting uh, the system. Um, you have to wait if you use both in a dual boot setup. You have to uh, you have to wait to switching um, the dot files. I just do this once manually, uh, and this was quite fine for me. But uh, there are also some um, um, employees which are um, often switch between Linux and OpenSea because not all the use cases work well out, and um, then you get in trouble with the dot files. The switching between OpenSea and Linux has also a problem with the clock because Linux um, saves another uh, kind of clock information into the BIOS or into, in, in, into the, the clock of the, of, of the board. Um, um, I think they, we or they um, use UTC, and, and the other one use uh, not, not, not UTC, UTC, so the clock is broken. I thought they fixed that. They fixed that? Yeah, uh, as far as I experienced... There is a way to fix it and tell the stupid Linux machine to use UTC. Ah, okay, problem. that's good to know. Um, I just ran into this problem and... Just uh, fix your Linux. Yeah, yeah <laughs> fix it Linux. But um, I run into this, this problem, so um, when the clock, the clock is shifting um, over several hours, then you you know um, there's this um, this problem. You have no no. You're slot. just in Germany. You barely notice. I'm here. When stupid Linux puts it in not in UTC, I notice immediately. Yeah, from here in Canada, you notice know, hour off. Quite well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but even one hour off is uh, kind of. Um, special. <coughs> Um, no swap uh, could be a problem. Um, the boot parameter I showed before is also able to inform the kernel where it's um, swap devices. And you can also um, export uh, over NFS uh, a swap petition. But this is quite slow um, for swap. If, if, this, if a normal computer starts swapping, you, you notice this because the application uh, gets a bit sucky and, um, and they don't uh, run quite well, but if you have eight gigabytes of RAM, normally you don't have to, you don't need swap. So uh, I deactivated uh, the S run when swap on the machine. So when they run out of memory, the application this is a feature. This is not a bug. This is a feature. What? What, what do you mean? This is deactivating swap on these devices. Pardon? Deactivating swap on yeah. these devices. Yeah, this is the decision I made, and it works quite well because. You barely came to the point of in a normal office situation that you need that amount of, of memory, so it, it will never happen. And the machine keeps to be um, uh, fast. I, I ran 250 Sun 350s disk lists yeah. with swap over NFS when you were probably not even an evil gleam in your father's eye. Trust me, you never want workstation swapping over NFS. Yeah. <laughs> Just don't do it. It was a exactly. bad idea. That's the reason why, why I turned off. Um, I don't have run into it, but if I think about it, um, another point is that you have non-persistent uh, slash temp. So over one boot cycle, if slash temp is uh, in, in memory, um, it's clean after a reboot. So maybe there are applications who have trouble with this. I don't yeah. um, see one. Well, the BSD clears it off every reboot. Yeah, uh, but I don't know if some, some um, other applications, uh, some Safari, um, uh, have trouble with this. And another problem I run into, uh, we have rolled out um, 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 central known host lists, and uh, because all my new Ubuntu workstations have other um, SSH keys, or host keys, I weren't able to log in because uh, um, from the from the older Linux workstations, I weren't able to log in because every uh, host changes its, uh, its host keys. Find your boss and tell him he's doing the known host wrong. You shouldn't roll out if you if you have a real company. Yeah. You shouldn't roll out big bags of central node host lists, you should sign your SSH keys for your hosts. And then you only need to provision one small little thing into every workstation that says, trust this, and sign by this. <coughs> That's right, and this would be uh, a modern way to handle this problem. Um, the infrastructure we have, um, as I mentioned before, we're studying in the, in the 90s with the US. There's a lot of tons of, uh, of scripting 
and um, engineering uh, generations um, going back to him, which are building the system constantly. So there are no um, break in it, and so we have to deal with a lot of old scripts. And this is uh, of one um, I'm running it. You could probably, for your workstations, yeah. just sign their key, keys, or generate them a key and slash as part of your script, sign it from a trusted host, and add right at the bottom of your known host list there. Oh, for our domain, trust the stuff signed by our, our SSH key signing host. And then you can slowly migrate away from the gigantic bag of, of known host bullshit, uh, where what you're doing for your, your discless ones becomes the norm for all the other workstations. They just get signed keys. So the, the, the list of signed keys, that, be, that becomes the exception. And what you're normally expecting is that you have an SSH host key that's signed by your company's trusted thing that blesses host SSH keys. This would be obviously uh, a modern version to fix this problem, but um, not in all companies we have this modern stuff. And, and so, but maybe you run into this problem, and now no, you know from Bob now uh, what the real uh, solution no, no, is. No, the other reason I say this is I've solved this problem on a very large scale. Oh, okay. Internally, but and it was a tire fire before that. So, okay. um, from an administrator's point of view, it's quite nice to have all the file system on one uh, on one machine. If you make remote maintenance <laughs> on machines and you have the problems that uh, uh, maybe the users turn off the machines uh, and you have a um, huge building and don't want to run around and boot them up uh, or uh, make some um, um, network wake online uh, stuff, it's quite nice because you can all you do is the maintenance on one system, even when the systems are running, when they're not running, because you have access to all root file systems and can make upgrades or something, or, or change the configuration. So this is quite nice, and it uh, works far better than uh, if you have this puppet-like infrastructure where you connect in remotely over off, uh, to every system and manage this. Um, so it's all maintenance. Can, it's can quite your users nice. get onto your server at all? Pardon? Can your users log into the server machine at all? Um, no, I don't think so. Make sure they can't. <laughs> Just they can't. Yeah. Those are dangerous. Um, I don't know what, uh, I, I don't think they have any right to, to write to this file system. Because I could boot single user, maybe put myself a bag of set UID files to have fun at it in my own slash, yeah. get out to the server and run them. That's right, yeah. But, but as far as I remember, um, they, they can't um, log in onto the server itself because the server isn't part of these domains. Um, um, and upgrades. Upgrades becomes pretty easy. So we don't have to upgrade every workstation. An upgrade would work in, in a way that you um, install a second server or completely force one and upgrade this. Um, and when you upgrade this and uh, roll out new uh, file systems for um, every machine, then the second server announces its uh, GHCP uh, client as a server of the service with its own um, an infrastructure. And then you can um, turn off the old one. <laughs> Just, uh, just to turn off the DHP client. And so every workstation is now running, just um, served by the old server, which is just still running. And um, when a client comes to the point that it reboots, then it automatically boots from the newer one and have uh, an upgrade. So you make a new server, turn the DHP on, the older one off, and then um, just say to the clients, whenever you want, reboot. Or you can force, uh, force um, the clients to reboot when you log in and type reboot as an administrator for a through. Um, and this is all. So you have um, upgraded all the workstations. And you don't have to be fiddling with um, upgrade processes remotely or someone running around your company and uh, manually upgrading the system. So you don't have to deal with this. And this is quite nice. So you have really one single point of administration. You don't have to worry about all these uh, systems in, in your company. Yeah. You have to make sure that you provide the same list to, to the client because the client will renew its IP with you running the HTTP server. So he has to get the same IP address yes. before it. <laughs> That's right. Site but it's, uh, I, um, I demand on this. This is um, or, or I depend on that um, every client has a static IP address. Um, <laughs> Which it comes uh, over HP. Um, but so you, you can run the system quite nice. Yeah. So this is all for like uh, workstations inside the same geographical location. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever had to make something like that work in multiple geographical no. locations? No. No. Um, um, we had the possibility because 
our uh, company have um, multiple locations, but just in Germany itself. So um, we don't get in trouble with, uh, of timing, time loops or something like, like that. Or what do you want? Um, uh, or just the time it would take to per packet across the internet. Uh, no, we don't have we don't have to face these problems. Uh, if we would, uh, maybe there are some new some new problems we have to think about. But uh, I just tried it out in our main um, uh, main destination, uh, and there I tried it. Or, or other locations we have, uh, I don't roll out with this. So at the end of my talk, do you have also questions? Bob? Are you using NFS phone on the user's home directories? Uh, yes. Okay. How are you dealing with uh, the security problems associated with that when I can boot my workstation single user, or is it just don't do it? Um, you, uh, yeah, um, yeah, I deal with the problem of the, of the single user. I turn it off, so or, or I make it um, an, an extra password uh, for it. Mm -hmm. And um, in general, we try to cap the physical um, access. To this network, the normal user is not able to plug that in another uh, another machine. Yeah, that's how we try to deal with that. If, if, if I can drop in or do anything on the local yeah. machine to root or to it, and I change the UID, then I could yeah, I could get the, to anybody's stuff over NFS. That's a that's a problem. Uh, we try to handle this with uh, with physical ac uh, access security. So it's it's physical yeah. security. Yeah, yeah, so. but. Um, to solve this problem in general, I think you have to you need a, a newer not run NFS, not run NFS, or, or, uh, <laughs> but then you, uh, the whole system is, don't work anymore. Um, I think uh, we maybe have to update NFS into a newer one. But uh, I don't say someone should do this, but uh, but this would be um, a real solution to make some. You, you said into a newer NFS. What you're thinking about is not NFS. <laughs> the answer is don't use it. Yeah, uh, but is there is there an, an alternative? Sorry, is there an alternative for this system to use not NFS? I don't. Uh, I can't remember. There, I don't see a good alternative that's going to be as nice for you and as yeah. performant Why for just this workstation. But yeah, yeah, plan nine. Um, there's, but we don't have support for this, as far as I remember. Yeah, so it's like in terms of, of doing something different from NFS for this, there isn't a good option. I'm just making sure you know you're aware of it. Yeah. But effectively, if the user can get local root. You know, and if I decide that you know my UID is 500 and, and Jan's UID is is 560, and I want to mess with Jan, I make my local account UID 560 and go blitzing in through NFS to his home directory and change whatever I want. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And no, all of those aren't as nice as you, Ron. Yeah. Good question. So, quick question: Everything was NFS three, and Bob's bringing up the security problem. So I worked at a high performance computing center where we couldn't use NFS for because when you're banging things at gigabits per second constantly, NFS four just fell over. But we did use NFS four to manage things like file transfers between users and make that easier and to set ACLs and that kind of thing. So is there any reason why you didn't look at NFS four if security was an issue, or yeah. that was a non-issue for you? Uh, our Linux workstations use NFS four or the newer ones, the, the, the newer version, um, and maybe some security features. But I don't know exactly uh, what, at which level. But for these uh, project or for these uh, tests, uh, I have to use NFS three because we don't have the infrastructure for newer ones. Mm -hmm. So there, there will be a lot of um, implementation. Um, effort involved to, to make this uh, happen. So just use uh, what's already there and, and test it out. Yeah, is there any other question? <laughs>